All right, thank you all for joining us today at the ninth annual Public Sector Summit. Uh, my name is Sri Nana Panini. I'm a senior solutions architect with AWS. I've been with AWS for about five and a half years now in this role for the last three and a half years. I work with the technology partners in the public sector space, help them build solutions on top of AWS, solutions such as their SaaS platforms, and bringing their existing products to the AWS marketplace so customers such as yourself can use them in your mission-critical workloads. So today our agenda is to talk about serverless and serverless architecture patterns. So a quick show of hands if you guys have worked with services like Lambda. Okay, that's a handful of you, and, and, and for those who have not had a chance to do that, not to worry. Uh, I structured the, present, the session today so that in, we'll talk about the first half, some of the foundational services in serverless, and then in the second half, uh, we'll spend some time reviewing some of the architecture patterns that we see customers leveraging today. Um, with that, I have one ask of a few. If you can hold on to your questions till the end, me and one of my colleagues will be right outside, right outside the door. So if you have any questions, we'll have you to take those questions at the end. Okay, let's dive right in. Uh, so when we, talk, when we think about the AWS spectrum of offerings today, I want to give you a perspective as to where serverless fits in, right? So we all are familiar at this point with Amazon EC2. So it's a service that gives you the virtual machines in the cloud. And customers have been leveraging virtual machines for quite some time now for a variety of applications, right? You know, it could be databases, could be managing your container clusters, uh, or it could be your mission-critical workloads. And with Amazon EC2, you, know, you, you, you provision your EC2 instance, you define your instance type, instance size, and you, man you maintain, manage, patch, and secure, and harden your systems. So it's, you as a customer has more flexibility. You're responsible for the underlying maintenance of, the, of your servers. And you're also responsible for scalability and availability aspect of your application. And next we have managed service offerings. So here we take away some of the undifferentiated heavy lifting in terms of maintaining and managing your systems. And we'll do that on your behalf. We'll patch the operating system so that you can focus on consuming the core functionality of the service and not have to worry about maintaining the servers. There are still very well servers involved in the managed services. You just don't have to manage them. You specify the instance type, instance size. And you also specify you know, how do you want the system to be. Do you want it to be multi-AZ, eventually highly available, or not? So there are still servers involved, but you just don't have to manage them. And next comes the serverless. So what I have on the screen here are some of the serverless services in, this, in, in the fleet of AWS service offerings today. And this is not the entire list of serverless services, some of them. But in this, the, the, the main difference here is that you as a customer don't manage anything underlying. You, you simply consume the service. So whether it is authentication from Cognito, whether it is Lambda for compute, API gateway to provide your APIs, uh, DynamoDB for the NoSQL database, or so on and so forth. Whatever, whatever the use case may be, you just consume the core functionality of the service without having to manage the servers or the scaling aspect of it. So with that, you know, kind of paint a picture on what we mean by serverless. When we say serverless, we have four key tenants, right? So obviously no servers. You know, if, if there's anything, if there's one thing developers like less of, that's servers, and that's serverless for us, right? So we have no servers to manage or provision. And then, when you think about scalability, right? So for any of you who have worked with AWS for, for any number of years, you understand the you know, multi-AZ concept and how scalability can be handled in a service like Amazon EC2 with auto scaling and et cetera. But with serverless, you don't have to do that, right? So the service automatically scales based on your usage. So if you have a number of invocations coming through a Lambda function or maybe a number of requests coming through your Amazon API gateway, the service kind of handles the scalability for you without you having to configure any levers and no knobs for you to tune. And now what happens when your request or when your service is being idle? So if you have a web application and there's a downtime or in a sense that there are no traffic coming into your application. So during the downtime, what happens? Or during the idle time, what happens? You don't pay for anything. So if you're not invoking your Lambda function, you're not paying anything for it. So if there are no requests coming through Amazon API Gateway, you're not paying for it, right? And how about high, uh, availability? So we talked about multiple AZs or multi-availability multi zones and how they're capable to deploy your application across multiple availability zones in EC2. So how does that work in the serverless world? Like I said, you, know, you, don't have to, you as a customer don't have to do anything. The service automatically scales that for you, and, and by default, it is highly available. 
So AWS Lambda really represents the core compute offering in the serverless, for the serverless applications. On one side, you have the event sources coming from a you know, variety of event sources. We'll see that in, in the next few slides. But there is an event source that triggers your Lambda function, and your Lambda function runs your, the business logic that you put together. And eventually, Lambda service can reach out to any other external service endpoints, whether it is an Amazon service or it could be an HTTP endpoint. As long as it has connectivity to reach a service, your Lambda function can reach the service and pull in the data together and respond back. So don't take my word for it, right? Our customers have been using serverless for a while now. As you see some of the familiar names here, uh, FINRA, Airbnb, Autodesk, et cetera, a lot of customers are using serverless in production uh, for their mission-critical workloads. So let's dive a little bit into Lambda and, and how you get started with Lambda. Today, for, with the AWS Lambda, we support five programming languages, Node.js, Java, Python, C Sharp, and Go. Uh, you as a developer have the opportunity to bring in your custom libraries, or you can even bring in the native libraries if you choose to overwrite the ones that are available in the Lambda execution environment. Authoring a Lambda function could be as simple as logging into the AWS Management Console and using the uh, rich text editor, the VisVig editor, or you can uh, start using your uh, favorite IDE, and we have plugins uh, to be able to, for, to, en enabling you to deploy to the Lambda service. When we think about configuring the service, right? When we think about EC2, you specify sort of the EC2 instance type, and, and obviously the, the VPC subnet and things like that. For Lambda, there is only one knob for you to tune, right? So it's really specifying what is the memory size that you want for your Lambda function. And today we support 128 megabytes all the way up to three gigabytes. When you specify the memory, we also allocate the appropriate CPU and network. So as you are testing your Lambda functions, I want you to think about a memory as a unit that you want to test. So you don't stick to one memory unit think, because you, you realize that your Lambda function does not need as much memory. So maybe you have a use case where you're, it is CPU intensive. right? By adding more memory to your function, you're not, you don't necessarily have to consume all of it, but there is a allocate, proportionate CPU that comes with it. So if you have a CPU intensive workload, I want you to think about increasing or testing different memory sizes and see which one performs better for you. And there's one other, one other aspect with AWS Lambda that I want you to think about, which is stateless. Meaning, I, when you're authoring your Lambda functions, you don't want to assume any affinity towards the underlying infrastructure. So if you have a need to store your data persistently, Think about external data stores like Amazon S3 or Amazon DynamoDB. But don't build any affinity towards the underlying, in the underlying infrastructure. Other, other, than that, other than that, the programming model doesn't really change, right? You have, the, you have the opportunity to create threads like you are used to, fork off processes, or even access the slash temp space. Slash temp space is, is available for you to use any of the temporary storage. Don't think of that as a persistent store between your invocations, because it is not, right? Uh, but if you have a need to use the slash temp or store, uh, store some of the data temporarily, you can do so in the slash temp. When we think about invoc invoking a Lambda function, there are two ways to invoke it, right? So synchronous and asynchronous. Synchronous, as the name suggests, a service is invoking a Lambda function and expecting a response back. In the asynchronous, you're invoking the Lambda function. Lambda function will run your business logic. There is no process waiting on the response back from Lambda, and it may eventually store the results in a persistent data store elsewhere. It has tight integration with AWS services, as we'll see in this slide. So when we talk about event sources, uh, there are a variety of event sources, uh, AWS services that are integrated with Lambda. You know, call it from data stores like Amazon S3 and DynamoDB, uh, endpoints like Amazon API and IoT services, or even Amazon Echo if you have one at home, or development and management tools like Amazon CloudWatch, or alerting tools like Amazon SNS for a messaging perspective. And we're adding continuously to add more to this, to this offering. Uh, there may be more services as we go along that gets added into, as an event source uh, that supports Lambda. So now let's take a bit about, uh, talk about a permission model. The security is important, of, of at most important at AWS, and so it is for our customers. So with Lambda having the ability to do literally anything, you know, security becomes an important aspect. Right? There are two ways where you want to put access controls to, for Lambda functions. One, 
what service can invoke my Lambda function, and whether it is an AWS service or an SDK using IAM roles. And the other one is, what services can your Lambda function access? Right? Do, I, do you want it to access all of your Amazon DynamoDB tables in your, Amazon, in your account? Are all the S3 buckets or only a certain S3 buckets? So the, the first one, what can invoke my Lambda function, is controlled through what we call a function policies. So when you're defining your Amazon uh, Lambda function, you have the ability to define function policies. In that, you define which resource can invoke your Lambda function. If, if it is an S3 bucket, which bucket, right, and which API calls. If it is an API gateway, which resource is an API gateway, so on and so forth. And for the execution role, uh, many of you, if you have worked with AWS at any capacity, uh, you already are familiar with the Identity and Access Management Service. So in the Identity and Access Management Service, we have a concept of IAM roles. Uh, and essentially here, it, that's the same IAM role, what we call here an execution role. So when your Lambda gets spun up, it is associated in an IAM role, and if there is an IAM policy associated with it, and those are the exact same um, functions, or same privileges your Lambda function is getting. So if you don't want to give your Lambda function access to the entire AWS account, administrative access, which you don't want to, right? you control with IAM policies. IAM policies give you the ability to create very fine-grained controls, and that's why we encourage our customers to do so here as well. So let's take a look at the basic anatomy of what a Lambda function would look like. And this is obviously the simplest thing, simplistic example, right? but the one that covers the basics for us. So the handler is sort of your entry point into your Lambda function. So when a Lambda function gets invoked, we call this handler, and here is where you would write your business logic. And as a best practice, what we, we encourage customers not to do is you don't want to put everything into one handler. Use the handler as an entry point and fork off into different uh, functions from that point on within your Lambda function. So when something gets invoked into your Lambda function, it passes an event. If it is a service like S3, as you've seen here, we pass an event. An event is a JSON object. And then there is also some contextual variables. Contextual variables like which Amazon region uh, the Lambda function is running in, which account number, right? or what is the function name, what's the function memory size. There are some, these are the runtime variables that are available for your Lambda function. If it makes sense to use them in your application, you could do so. And finally, uh, we'll talk, I'll talk about the logging and monitoring aspect in a different slide, but I, I simply want to mention one thing here. So if you want to log information from your Lambda functions, you don't have to think about coming up with a, a big logging library or anything. You can simply use a console.log like in Node.js or print, print statements in your Python. And this, this information gets logged into CloudWatch logs. And for those asynchronous, synchronous invocations, you can send a response back, like, like the one we see here, callback. If, you, if your uh, request or event source expecting a response back, you can send a response back, like a success message or a particular JSON object back. Now, let's talk about the Amazon API Gateway. So Amazon API Gateway represents another key component in our serverless architectures, especially for the web applications where customers are building microservices uh, using API Gateway. So API, Amazon API Gateway, as the name suggests, it is an API Gateway, right? So it sort of acts as your front end for a variety of many of your uh, microservices. And you can unify a lot of microservices behind one Amazon API Gateway. So when we think about APIs, or when we think about microservices, there are some of the standard things that you expect to do, right? So security, and author, uh, security which is authentication and authorization, and being able to protect your APIs from DDoS attacks. Uh, being able to throttle your APIs, right? Meter, if you, if you are a developer who are providing APIs to external developers, you want to be able to meter them. You want to be able to cache your responses. You want to be able to transform the responses before it goes back to the uh, backend. And maybe it's coming back from the backend and you want to transform it before you send it back to the user. So these are the, some of the capabilities that you expect your, uh, your API gateway to do. And that's exactly what Amazon API Gateway offers. So all the functionality that I just talked about, DDoS production, authentication, authorization, caching, throttling, metering, usage, all of those are the functionality, which is what Amazon API Gateway offers for our customers. Next is the step functions. So maybe you're working on a, a mon mon decomposing a monolithic application, trying to fit in, into a serverless world. Right? So as, you are as you're thinking about decomposing a big application, or even thinking about writing, or maybe you have a need in your Lambda functions where it needs to fan out and kick off more Lambda functions from one point on, right? 
So instead of having to deal with the logic all by yourself, if you have a workflow orchestration needs, you, must, you, you could use the uh, AWS Stuff Functions. So AWS Stuff Functions is a workflow management service with the, you know, you, you as a customer don't have to, again, deal with any of the servers like we've seen in the other services. So if you have a distributed application where you need to coordinate tasks between the nodes or pass data between, uh, between activities, or you simply want to, you, you have a need to handle the error handling and retries. All of that can be achieved using AWS Step Functions. And I have some of the architecture patterns that leverages Step Functions as well as some of the other services that we're talking about. It. Now let's talk about security and identity. So how do we handle security and identity in the space of serverless? So we, we, you know, I think most of you are familiar today um, at this point for the identity and access management. The role of the identity and access management from the AWS IAM service has not changed, right? So any API that we provide in the AWS services is protected, can be controlled and protected through the AWS IAM service. On top of that, we have Amazon Cognito. So if you are a mobile developer, chances are you're familiar with the Amazon Cognito service. Amazon Cognito, is a, Cognito service has two components today, two key components. One is Cognito user pools, and the other one is Cognito federated identities. So if you, you know, authentication is a big deal, right? So when you don't want to reinvent the wheel and perhaps you don't want to undertake the task of creating an authentication system. So we see a lot of customers leveraging Amazon Cognito to be able to handle either their federation through social identities like, you know, login with Facebook, login with Amazon, uh, et cetera, or even to any other enterprise sample providers or open ID providers. So Amazon Cognito has a major role in in handling the authentication authorization of the users in the serverless space. So I mentioned very briefly in the, when, we, when, we, when we looked at the anatomy of the Lambda code, you know, how we do the handling. And let's talk about some sort of the logging and monitoring aspects, right? So chances are you're already are familiar with Amazon CloudWatch. So Amazon Lambda, AWS Lambda, and Amazon API Gateway provides enhanced detailed metrics to the customers things such as latency, things such as number of invocations uh, that are happening in your Lambda functions, things such as you know, the duration it took for your Lambda function to complete the request. And when we talk about Amazon API Gateway, the latency and the integration latency and the 400 and the 500 and the HTTP codes. So some of these details or some of these metrics are available to customers using through Amazon CloudWatch. In the Amazon CloudWatch, we also have a concept of Amazon CloudWatch Locks, a new service, right? So we talked about how Lambda can log all the information from the console.logs and print straight into the CloudWatch logs. So you can go into the CloudWatch logs as a centralized log store to be able to debug and troubleshoot or simply check out your logs from, from your Lambda functions. And next is the AWS X-Ray. Um, I'm not sure if you guys have heard of this service, but one that is of, of extreme importance, especially in the Lambda world, is if you want to have the deep visibility into what your function is doing, right? So where, which AWS resources, resources it is accessing? How, what is the latency between your Lambda function and DynamoDB, for example? Once your, once your logic makes an API call to DynamoDB, how long it, the call took? So you can get deep visibility into these metrics using AWS X-Ray. So AWS X-Ray SDK is available. You can wrap all the API calls using AWS X-Ray SDK and then go, and be able to go into the X-Ray dashboard and see traces like this or the maps like this and it can, it can, especially if helpful in troubleshooting scenarios and, and, and very good tool to help you debug and increase your performance, um, help with the performance issues. So how does this all come together, right? So obviously, you know, you guys are developers and you don't expect to do things in the console uh, and you all nice um, want a way to programmatically author your Lambda functions and deploy them and manage them on, on a continuous basis. So you, some of you may be familiar with the AWS CloudFormation already. So CloudFormation is infrastructure as a code service, and a lot of customers use that today uh, to automate uh, and to automate the deployments and, and version control their infrastructure uh, configuration as well. So AWS SAM is really an extension of that. SAM, short for serverless application model, is really an extension of the AWS CloudFormation, and its specification allows to define the serverless services like Lambda Functions and Amazon API Gateway in the less verbose format. And for those of you who are sometimes working in a disconnected world, and you may want to have a, a, the ability to test your Lambda functions in Amazon API Gateway locally on your laptop. Maybe you're not connected to the internet all the time. And for that, we have something called SAM CLI. 
So SAM CLI is essentially a container that runs on your laptop and, and simulates your Lambda invocations and Amazon API Gateway requests. And finally, we also have a AWS a serverless rep application repository, so where a lot of customers can share their serverless applications that they put together, and you can kind of browse them from the Amazon Management Console uh, as well. So finally, let's talk about compliance, right? So we have customers, obviously, especially in the public sector space, our compliance, uh, compliance is a critical aspect. And, and all of our serverless services that, that you see on the screen here are enabled for financial and healthcare applications. So they are PCI and HIPAA compliant. So if you have a PCI and HIPAA compliant need, you could, still, you could leverage the serverless services as well. So now let's talk about the architecture patterns. Uh, these are the architecture patterns uh, that we see customers are using in production today. Right? These are not something that we came up out of the blue. These are, these, these are the architecture patterns and design patterns that we see customers are leveraging in their production workloads. So before we dive into the architecture patterns, I want to give you a snapshot view of use cases and where we see serverless fits in. As you can see here, there are a variety of use cases, right? So starting from web applications to their backends, and backends could be as simple as microservices from API Gateway or an IoT backend, uh, where you have you know, fleets of sensors out there that are sending back to the AWS IoT service, uh, and you're using, uh, using that to handle it. Or maybe a data processing job, so maybe you have a lot of files that gets uploaded into S3 bucket and you want to process them, uh, real time or batch processing. And chatbots are getting increasingly popular, right? So every, almost every industry and every application has a need for a chatbot today. So if you want to interact with your users, if you want to provide information interactively with your users, you know, chatbot is probably a use case for you. Uh, Amazon Alexa, so maybe you're a developer out there who wants to create a voice skill kit uh, for, your, uh, for your users uh, through Amazon Echo. Right? And again, so when you're developing Amazon Alexa skill kit, AWS Lambda plays a very integral part of that. And, and the last one, and but not definitely not the least, is IT automation. So automation plays an important role for our customers and, and generally is the sort of the entry point for many of our customers into the serverless space is IT automation. Right? So there are a lot of uh, services within the uh, Amazon AWS platform, like Amazon CloudWatch, et cetera, that, that captures all the API calls and can trigger events. And you, know, these, you can use these events to enforce your corporate security policies. So we see a lot of customers using IT automation as an as a, as a, as a entry point into serverless. So let's talk about the first pattern, which is the web application. Right? When we think about web application, we're all familiar generally, right? you know, we, there's, there's going to be static content that you want to render to your users, you know, whether it's a static website or maybe static assets that are part of your web application. And then you have dynamic content. Right? It's based on the user needs and based on the user requests. You want to send them a dynamic content back. And maybe you've created a bunch of microservices that powers your web application. And you, want, you obviously want it to be extensible. right? And then from a security perspective, you want to know who the users that are using your web application so that you can apply appropriate authorization policies. So you need to have a way to authenticate and authorize your users. And not to mention the scalability and globally available users. As you, 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 know, you, you want the, your application to scale, you want your application to be globally available. So these are the typical aspects of any web application that we commonly see. And the same thing applies to serverless. So now how do we solve these, how do we put together a design that understands all these characteristics. So a quick show of hands if this looks familiar to you. Right, I would expect more, but that's good. Right, so you know, our customers have been using Amazon S3 in combination with Amazon CloudFront for a while now. Right? Amazon CloudFront is our content delivery network, the one that you could use to deliver static assets or dynamic assets uh, relatively with low latency uh, and the high speed networks. And Amazon S3 is our cloud storage solution, right? A durable storage. S3 has a functionality for static website uh, where you can host websites on S3 and you can deliver them through CloudFront. Uh, this is a pattern that we see customers are using for a very long time now. And the same pattern applies. So maybe you have a single page of web application that you are hosting in S3 and you're serving, uh, serving it up through CloudFront for your global audience. So, so that's how you would handle the static content part. Now how about the dynamic content? So as we talked about earlier, Amazon API Gateway acts as a front end for your dynamic content. So essentially all of your microservices are behind your Amazon API Gateway, powered by Amazon AWS Lambda for a compute. So core, core compute is coming from uh, Lambda, 
And for your persistent data stores, you're using a service like Amazon DynamoDB, right? Or Amazon S3, for example, as well. So over a period of time, you know, you may, you may add more functionality to your web application. You may add no, more features. So that means you're adding more microservices. So as you add more microservices, you can put them all together under the same API gateway and use it as a front end for your application. Or you can create a one more API gateway if that suits your use case better. So we haven't talked about you know, how, do I, how do I authenticate my users here, right? So how do I handle security? We talked about Cognito and the role of Cognito in the security space uh, for, for the web applications. So again, the same thing applies here. So you could leverage instead of building and sort of reinventing the wheel and building an authentication system, which is quite complex, you could leverage a service like Amazon Cognito, which has, at this point, a lot of capabilities built in. You could even have a hosted UI within the Cognito user pool service. You can federate to other social identity providers. All in all, bringing it together, and it, nice, it integrates very well with the Amazon API gateway. So you could provide your microservices and, pro, and, and, and provide them as a RESTful APIs and use Amazon Cognito to provide the authentication mechanism for that. You could very well use Amazon IAM as well, but Cognito plays very well, uh, a very integral part in this architecture. So there are a lot of customers using that, that architecture that we've just seen, right? So a lot of customers. One that I want to call out is Bustle.com. Bustle.com is a news, entertainment, lifestyle, and fashion website targeted women. And they used to run their web application on a traditional infrastructure. Moving to serverless, they were able to save 84% of the savings. There are a couple of features I want to call out with the API gateway. One is the regional API endpoints. Regional API endpoints, as they, as they sound like it, right, they're the regional. So that if you have applications that want to leverage your microservices in a given region, you want to create an API gateway and you want to create a regional endpoint so that all the requests go to the, in that region. What if you have a situation where you want to enable your microservices globally and you want to have an active active footprint across multiple regions? So the regional API gateway in conjunction with the capabilities of Amazon Rock 53 can enable that, right? So you can enable multi-region capabilities using regional API endpoints. One I don't have a slide for, but the one we launched probably three days ago at this point is a capability called private APIs. So a lot of customers have asked us, hey, we like Amazon API Gateway, we'd like to use it, but I don't have a need to expose my APIs to the internet. Yes, I can protect them using Cognito, yes, I can protect them using Amazon AWS IAM, but I simply don't have a need to expose my APIs to the internet. So we didn't have a capability uh, for the private APIs in the past, and, and I think as of four days ago, we launched the capability. So if you have a, a a need where you want to expose your APIs only to your VPC, only to the applications running in the VPC, or maybe your application is running on-prem, and you want to expose your APIs to your on-prem service. So now you can leverage the private API capability of the Amazon API Gateway and expose your APIs only to the networks that you want it exposed and not by default to the internet. And the next pattern here is the automation. So as I mentioned, Automation, in is, automation has a variety of use cases, right? So more specifically in the IT automation from a security perspective, right? security automation, as well as some of the complex applications may have a workflow orchestration needs. So automation has a play in every, um, in every variety of use cases. So when we think about automation, you know, there are a couple of characteristics of automation. Right? These are the things that you want to do on a schedule. These are the things you want to do when something happens, for example, in, in your AWS account. And these are the things when you want to happen when an alert gets generated on your behalf, right? You want to take it, you, you want to remediate that alert automatically. So let's take a look at an example of where you want to enforce a security policy because an action has, somebody took an action in your, in your AWS account. So this is, this is a quite common use case, right? So security groups are sort of your uh, front door for your uh, Amazon EC2 instances. And customers use security groups to whitelist a variety of IP addresses, and they usually block them uh, for within their own private IP address range unless the particular service is supposed to be internet facing. Even then, there are cases where we don't want port 22 or port 3389 for RDP or some of the privileged ports to be exposed over the, in the internet. Yet again, things can happen. And cost, you know, some of your developers and maybe your operations team could accidentally open up a port. And we want to, our customers want to remediate those actions as they happen. It happened, and we want to remediate as quickly as, it, as quickly as possible. 
and be able to trigger an alert, maybe to the security team so that they, they can follow up and see what happened, right, and fix the process perhaps. But we want to, more importantly, we want to remediate that alert as it happens. So that's exactly what this use case is, right? So we have a, an action that ha generated, by, generated by the user, somebody opened up a security group ingress rule for the World Wide Web, and they opened it on RDP port. So if you're familiar with the Amazon CloudWatch events, Amazon CloudWatch events leverages the AWS CloudTrail logs that's generated. So AWS CloudTrail captures all the API calls that happen in your, in your Amazon account, whether we take it on your behalf or somebody does in your account, all those details are captured in the CloudTrail. And CloudWatch events exposes those events, exposes the CloudTrail logs, and be able to trigger a Lambda function. So you can define a CloudWatch event that says, okay, if, it, if there is an EC2 API call that changes that change my security group rule, I want this to trigger a Lambda function. So you're, 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 leveraging the capable, you're leveraging that capability of the CloudWatch events here by creating a rule and triggering a Lambda function. Lambda function knows which resource was changed because that's an event that was passed by the CloudWatch to Lambda, and it will change, it will identify what rule was added because you wrote the business logic, and it will remediate the rule and put it back the security, put, put the security group back to where it belongs and send an alert to your security team, hey, something has happened in your Amazon account, go take a look. But we took the, act, more importantly, we took the action, we resolved the issue, and we alerted the right teams. So this is in a pattern that we see a lot of our customers do. One that I wanna call out is Autodesk. So Autodesk provides software and services to a variety of industry uh, today, and they have a lot of engineering teams that wants to uh, experiment, and they work on experiment projects. For them, setting up an AWS account and hardening, this, uh, hardening the AWS account to the corporate security policies was a task, and it was taking almost like 10 hours. So moving to serverless, it has come down from serverless to less than 10 minutes, right? So in their process, what they created is a framework called Taylor, and they even open source their product, and I have the link here, and you'll have the slides, I think, in the, uh, in the slide share. So they open source the product, and I think it's available for, you guys, for, your, for everybody to use and even you know, add more functionality if you choose to do so to that framework. AWS Ops Automator is a solution from AWS. So one of our solution builders team put together in, in, uh, the solution, and chances are if you're worked with Amazon EC2, you, you, know, you may have to deal with EBS snapshots, lifecycle of EBS snapshots across multiple accounts, multiple regions. Uh, maybe even so for Redshift, right? So we could use the pattern, the, like the one you're seeing on the screen, to automate your EBS snapshots across multiple accounts in multiple regions. In this, in this example, we're using, again, the CloudWatch events. And in, in this case, instead of having it a trigger-based or event-based, it's gonna be a recurring schedule. Because we, we all want to take EBS snapshots to back up your data, maybe on a daily basis, right? So you want to use CloudWatch events as a recurring scheduler to kick off a cron job. In this case, it'll, tr it'll trigger a Lambda function. This Lambda function goes to the DynamoDB table, fetches the task configuration, kicks off another Lambda function, and that Lambda function will assume a role either in the same account or in a different account, and looks for the EBS volumes that have a tag called Ops Automator Task List with a value of create snapshot. As long as it finds that value and that, and that key, it'll create those snapshots and maintain the lifecycle of them. Now, the, the broader point I want to bring up here is that you could leverage a pattern like this to literally do a lot of automation activities in, in your operations. So now let's talk about some of the application uh, scenarios where you, want to, where you want to automate part of your application. Maybe you have a, a complex workflow that needs to be orchestrated. So maybe you're handling user upload images into your S3 bucket and once the user uploads that image, you want to kick off set of workflows. Right? This is a very common use case that we see, and, and let's see how we can handle that in a serverless space. So we have a user, a user uploads images into your S3 bucket, or they upload through your web, web application, and you're storing them in Amazon S3. So we all know at this point, Amazon S3 can kick off a Lambda function. But in this case, we have a workflow that we want to define, right? Yes, I can write my, the, you can write the logic in your Lambda function to handle the workflow, or like we've seen before, we can leverage the AWS step functions. So that's what we're gonna do here, right? So we're gonna have the, when the user uploads an image into your S3 bucket, you're gonna kick off a Lambda function, and that Lambda function's job is to start a workflow that is powered by the AWS step functions. So in this step functions, we'll do multiple things, right? So one step could be extract the metadata out of your image, 
to qualify if that's the right image format that you support or not. So you can, you can qualify if this is the right image format you support. If it is the right image format that you support, great. Now you want to kick off additional tasks in parallel this time to do other things. Maybe you want to send a, the image to the Amazon recognition service so it can detect the objects and scenes within that image. At the same time, you also want to create a thumbnail of that image. So you want to do these two, tis, two tasks in parallel. And finally, once that is done, you want to pass that next to the next step and store that information into a, a, persistent DynamoDB, a persistent store like Amazon DynamoDB. And finally, you want to expose that information to your users through your web application by reading the, through the um, uh, DynamoDB table. So if you look at the behind the scenes, how something like this would look uh, in sub functions. As I mentioned earlier, sub functions provides a visual workflow in the management console. Every time a workflow gets kicked off, you can go into the management console and have a visual feedback as to how your workflow is uh, functioning. And this is a, uh, this, the entire application, the way it is seen here is available in our GitHub database labs. So github.com slash AWS labs, this Lambda image refactoring application uh, is available with full. So next up is the stream processing, right? So I want you to think about scenarios where you're collecting a clickstream analysis from your through your web application. So you want to analyze your user's behavior. Or maybe you are, you are a provider where you have a lot of IoT sensors uh, that spread across and you're collecting data from them. So these are all the use cases for stream processing, right? So you have a lot of high data ingesting into your platform. Message durability is important. And because you are sort of reacting to the user's actions that happened in the past, message ordering also becomes important, right? And this kind of traffic tends to be spiky. And you want to be able to process them in near real time. How do we handle that in a serverless world? Amazon Kinesis plays an important role here. Amazon Kinesis, in combination with AWS Lambda, is a very popular architecture in the stream processing space. So here we have data that's coming in into Amazon Kinesis streams. And Amazon Kinesis streams can pass that event to two different Lambda functions that does various things at the same time. So data coming into Amazon Kinesis, it kicks off a Lambda function. And one Lambda function takes the data, aggregates it, puts it into a DynamoDB, and also pushes some metrics into CloudWatch metrics. And at the same time, another Lambda function is taking the same, same event and pro manipulating the data and storing it in Amazon S3 for durable storage. So this is a quite a popular uh, architecture uh, pattern in the uh, streaming processing space. Now, if we want to apply that to an use case, to, to an IoT use case specifically, so we have these thermostats, for example, uh, that are across you know, millions of them that are sending temperature data back to back in by the Amazon IoT platform. So Amazon IoT platform lets you do a couple of things. Right? One of the capabilities is to be able to ingest all the data coming in and then create rules and then define actions. So if it matches a rule, you want to define certain actions. And one of those actions could be send the data straight into S3 bucket because you want to store the actual raw data for, you know, for a processing at a later time. Maybe you have a different algorithm as to how you want to process the data. So you want to preserve and store the record as it comes in. And then you also want to send the data to Kinesis Streams. If you send the data to Kinesis Streams, you can essentially leverage the arch architecture that we saw earlier in the same model here and process the data and eventually process the data in a different data store. Maybe you want to batch all those records uh, and send them into Kinesis Firehose. Kinesis Firehose lets you batch data records and, and store them in, in S3 as a batch records rather than individual record formats. And the last architecture pattern that I want to talk about is batch processing. Uh, when we think about batch processing, imagine a scenario where you're getting a bunch of files in, delivered into an S3 bucket, and you want to process them as they come in. But these files are big enough where a single Lambda function cannot do the job. Maybe you want to split the files by number of lines. Maybe you want to split the files by, by file size. And then you can, so to achieve that, when the, when the user uploads a, an object into S3 bucket, here we're going to use a Lambda function to split the function, to split the file, and kick it off to multiple mapper functions. And these mapper functions will run your business logic, process the data, and store that information in, in the, something like an Amazon DB table. Right? And then you have one more Lambda function taking the information off of the Amazon DynamoDB and acts as a reducer, essentially. It takes information there, the process data, and puts it in Amazon S3 for a more durable storage. And there is a pattern that I, I don't have a slide for, but I want to highly mention since we have time is, 
once you have the data in Amazon S3, there are services that I want, to think, I want you to think about are like Amazon Glue, uh, Athena, and QuickSight. Amazon Glue lets you, lets you detect, so Amazon Glue is an ETL as a service, right? So you can do ETL data using Glue, but it also has a capability called crawlers. So Amazon Glue can go into your data in S3 bucket and update the Amazon Athena, uh, Athena tables. Using Athena, you can create uh, interactive SQL queries uh, without having to manage any servers behind it. So if you want to create a, a visualization dashboards, you can use Amazon QuickSight as a service, integrate into Athena, and be able to create these dashboards and share that with your users across the, your enterprise. One customer we see using the batch processing pattern that we just saw is Fannie Mae. So Fannie Mae runs Monte Carlo simulations for their financial modeling, and they used to do that on a traditional infrastructure and moving to serverless, they were able to run their simulations four times faster than they used to. With that, I want you guys to go to the aws.amazon.com slash serverless to learn more about our partner solutions, uh, getting started resources, use cases, and other developer tools that we make available. All of this is available in one place. And I encourage you to go there. So don't forget to complete your assessment uh, in your mobile app, and we really thank you guys for coming here today.